Sir. So time is up. We must move on to questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning. And before we begin, can I inform members that questions 1 and 9 have been withdrawn? And as the first question on the list has been withdrawn, I call Ms Bronwyn McGeffen. Question 2. In 2013, I established an, an, an advanced manufacturing and engineering services working group with membership from employers, colleges, universities and government in order to identify and address the skills challenges faced by employers in this sector. In April 2014, I launched an action plan agreed by the group, and since then a number of initiatives have been taken forward. For example, a computing and engineering scholarship programme that has been developed, off offering uh, funded support to assist 20 employers offering work placements to undergraduate students taking the relevant degree courses that meet employer needs in computing and engineering. Also, a computer numerical control machining conversion course is being delivered and funded by my department's Assured Skills programme. This will upskill 12 Magellan Aerospace staff. It is due to complete in October, at which point it will be evaluated with a view to rolling it out within the sector. Furthermore, a higher level apprenticeship in engineering commenced in November 2013, with 15 apprentices from companies such as Terex, Covergo and the Quinn Group. These apprentices will be doing a foundation degree on a part-time basis with the South West Regional College. Another key action which has been taken forward is the development and implementation of a careers attractiveness strategy. This will inform young people and their key influencers about the wide range of career opportunities available in this sector. The aim of the action plan is to upskill the existing workforce across the sector to meet the exact needs of local employers and to ensure there is a pipeline of highly skilled young people keen to embark on a, on a career in this exciting industry. I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, as you know, in, in my constituency of, of South Tyrone, the promotion of engineering is a, a realistic and long-term careers option. And Minister, can you ensure um, that the appropriate skills will be trained up for to ensure the long-term uh, sustainability of this vital industry? Yes, I'm happy to assure the member that this is something where we are working on, uh, and uh, she is uh, certainly lucky that the, the, she has the South West College in her area, which are very proactive uh, in terms of working uh, with uh, local employers, and that goes for the colleges right across Northern Ireland uh, as well. Um, we are very much guided by the needs of employers, and it's important that um, we hear not just the very general skills that employers need, but also the very specific skill shortages that they may be experiencing, so we can ensure that the education and training system uh, responds. And this um, working group does give us the structures around which uh, we can um, provide a form in which we do that efficiently and effectively. Call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Uh, given that there have been serious uh, job losses in the sector since the action plan was devised, uh, when the Minister evaluates it, will he be looking at a more broadly based plan, which in fact caters? better for the geographical spread of job losses, which are not just confined to one area. Well, I certainly recognise that we have seen some job losses uh, in, in the sector, but it's also worth stressing that we've also seen new jobs being created. Um, for example, we've had the expansion uh, of, of Caterpillar uh, and uh, new, new jobs being undertaken uh, through, through that company. Um, equally, I mean, there's a host of other companies that are going from strength to strength. Um, we have very clear indications that the uh, aerospace space and, and uh, defence sectors in Northern Ireland uh, have a very bright uh, future, and uh, they are very keen to ensure that they have a, a steady flow of, of people com coming through. It is also important that uh, people are prepared to be a little bit mobile in terms of where they go for work. We can't always direct the work to where people, people live. I think there has to be a focus to an extent on, on good uh, labour uh, mobility. But it is worth stressing that we have a, a broad range uh, of engineering uh, strength in the Northern Ireland e economy, and there's a number of different clusters in different parts uh, of, of Northern Ireland. They all have their, each their, in their individual strengths, and we're happy to work with them all. Call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. The Minister will be aware one of the actions uh, from the action plan uh, was for employers to attend career service regional unit meetings. Can I ask the Minister how many such meetings have been held uh, since the plan was published and what percentage uh, have seen that recommendation actioned? Well, I don't 
don't have those precise figures uh, to hand, but I, I can uh, say to the member that there's a, a number of actions that are being taken forward in terms of careers, and he will be aware that there's a, currently a joint review of careers being undertaken with the Department of, of Education. Uh, that's been taken forward uh, by a panel that's chaired uh, by uh, Brian Ambrose from the George Best uh, Belfast uh, City Airport. We've also placed um, career staff directly in employers so they have a better understanding of the needs of, of employers. So rather than necessarily employers having to come to us, we've been even more proactive in actually sending the careers staff to, to be embedded within the business community, including within the engineering sector, so they're better able to articulate the needs of that sector uh, to potential uh, workers of the future. Mr Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, a great deal of work that has been done by you and your department in developing apprenticeships in engineering. Can the Minister tell us uh, what further work he is doing uh, to develop apprenticeships and to demonstrate to uh, young people particularly that apprenticeships are of high value equivalent to degrees? Well, um, the member, indeed, the, the entire assembly will be aware that we uh, released a, a new strategy for apprenticeships in Northern Ireland uh, in June of, of, of this year. Uh, this is a radical departure from the previous situation with apprenticeships, and we are hoping to see a considerable expansion uh, of the range of occupations and also the skill levels uh, to which they are being applied. One of the key areas which we are seeking to, to do differently is also to ensure a much stronger voice for employers in terms of, of, of apprenticeships. We are working to develop a number of sectoral partnerships that will focus on the needs of particular sectors, uh, and I am confident that engineering will be one of the first ones that we will be uh, seeking to develop. I had a meeting last week with employers in the ICT sector with a view to setting up a sectoral partnership, which went very well, and I am due to have a meeting of the, the Action Group uh, itself uh, on the 14th of October. And one of the items on the agenda for that meeting will be the creation of a sectoral partnership within the engineering sector uh, to develop more and more uh, in terms of uh, uh, opportunities in terms of apprenticeships. Thank you. And I call Mr Stephen Moutry. Question number three, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, plans for the new Craig Evan, Craig Evan campus uh, due to replace the current Lurgan and Porta Down facilities are at an early stage. The potential for the college to utilise the new leisure facilities is actively being considered. Southern Regional College has confirmed that it is fully aware of the, of the proposal for new district council leisure facilities and consequently is not intending to build a sports hall, a swimming pool, football or other sports pitches as part of the new campus in Craigavon. The college is in regular communication with the district council and will continue this engagement with a view to establishing formal arrangements whereby the college can utilise the new leisure facilities. The member will appreciate that these discussions have been at a strategic level, given that the locations for the new leisure facilities and the college campus have yet to be identified. I fully recognise the mutual benefits that can be obtained from the use of shared services, and my department's successful capital build to the Together Building a United Community Programme to fund the Craig Gavin Campus project demonstrates the focus on integration across the further education estate. At a time of increased pressures on funding, there is a heightened awareness of and attention on the importance of maximising the use of resources through developing shared facilities. Motri for a supplementary. Well, Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the answer given by the Minister today. I believe the potential for the two bodies to work together is enormous. But can I further ask the Minister, is he confident that this uh, vital project will proceed, given the wrecking tactics of Sinn Féin in relation to welfare reform? Well, I, I think some uh, degree of assurance can be given in that this is a, a capital uh, programme, and indeed the, the first tranche of money has been secured as part of the Together Building a United Community uh, funding programme. So that does give a, a degree of certainty in relation to this. There will be a need for further capital bids to be made around the balance of money that is required uh, to make this happen. Most of the pressure uh, in terms of the budgets at present uh, are in the revenue area, and the member is quite right to, to express uh, alarm. Uh, and what is already a difficult situation is set to rapidly deteriorate over coming years. Where I do see a difficulty is that if we end up having to make cuts in terms of the further education sector, we end up building uh, colleges that are of, of world-class standard without the, the resource to properly equip them and to ensure that we're investing in the students who will be taking advantage of them. Mr. Lourdes Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, I note uh, that there's been permission given to go ahead with the development proposal in the new, I think the work to conclude sometime in the new year. But I just wonder how uh, successful, how much of a guarantee you can give us that there will be the money actually to deliver the project within the next uh, three to four years. 
Well, I would maybe ask the member to give us a guarantee that her parties will see sense around uh, budget issues and ensure we have sustainable finances in Northern Ireland. And in that, we have the answer to her question. Thank you. And I call Mr. Phil Flanagan. Question number four. Uh, in implementing Graduating to Success, uh, my department has established a project group to facilitate cross-border cooperation and student mobility. A key part of this project is addressing the relevant recommendations from the Irish Business and Employers Confederation and the CBI Joint Business Council study of obstacles to cross-border undergraduate education. In particular, my department's career service continues to build the knowledge of its advisors to ensure that students are fully informed about opportunities in the UK and the Republic of Ireland. An anomaly in relation to student finance has been resolved, and since 2013, students from Northern Ireland studying in the Republic of Ireland have had access to a repayable student contribution loan and other financial support. The Department of Education is in the lead uh, regarding A-level and leaving cert uh, certificate equivalences. However, a number of individual universities have introduced interim measures to attract students from here. My officials are working with officials in the Department of Education and Skills to research and analyse cross-border student flows. A joint report which will inform policy development is scheduled for completion in the autumn. I met with Minister Quinn uh, of the Department uh, in April 2014 to discuss matters of mutual interest. I have also written to his successor, uh, Minister Jan O'Sullivan, and will be discussing matters with her at the North-South Ministerial Council this Friday. Mr Flanagan for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, given that we are uh, nearly at the end of autumn here, but you would not think it with the weather, does the Minister have um, any indication as to, to what is likely going to be in this report that he is teasing us with? Well, I am not quite sure what the weather is like in Fermanagh, but autumn, um, in, in my mind, uh, extends uh, through at least to the end uh, of November. So there is still time for this report uh, to, to come through. But I, I would say to the Member, and it is something I have said on a number of occasions, there is no lack of willingness in terms uh, of this jurisdiction, whether it is the Department of Education or whether it is through my own department, uh, to address the issues and the barriers that exist to student flows on the island of Ireland. M most of the obstacles do lie in terms of the policies and practices in terms of the, the government uh, in the Irish Republic. And at times, we have to question their willingness to be proactive in addressing uh, some of these points. And if the member has any influence in that regard, I would encourage him to use it uh, alongside uh, the influences of others to, to, to see how we can actually address these issues. Mr. Gregory Campbell, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, the minister will know that my constituency extends from four miles from the border to 50 miles from the border. And uh, while there may be a very small number of people who want to extend their mobility to take advantage of classes in the Irish Republic, the vast majority do not. Will he give the House an assurance that whatever resource he is deploying in this regard will not be at the expense of promoting mobility for students within Northern Ireland to try and avail of the classes which they require to try and get them into full-time employment in this country? Well, I think it's we, I think it's important we look at mobility in a range of, of different ways. When I mean, we have mobility, as the member says, in terms of Northern Ireland, uh, some students may wish to study in Great Britain. Other students may wish to study uh, in the Republic of Ireland. And sometimes it's not just about geographic proximity that will influence decisions. It's about the availability of, of certain courses. Uh, and while I do want to see a very broad range of courses being provided in Northern Ireland, there may be certain areas where certain specialisms uh, are, are more effectively taught elsewhere in, in these islands. And, I stress that in the broadest sense, and it is important that we do facilitate uh, mobility in, in that regard. Also, whenever we have to invest, for example, in specialist equipment or some, some, sometimes specialist teaching, um, neither jurisdiction on the island may have the resources to invest in that alone, uh, so there may well be opportunities uh, for uh, joint, in, joint initiatives. So it is important that we do not just see mobility on the island as being a cross-border issue. It, it may well be about ensuring choice uh, right across the island and, indeed, right across these islands. I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for your answers thus far. <clears throat> Minister, um, with regards to the interim measures that some of the universities have put in place in the South, what steps are you taking uh, to ensure that particularly students who want to do uh, high quality courses that are available in the South that are not available here, that, that they have good, good opportunity in that field? Um, well, 
Most of the courses that um, would be available at present in the Republic of Ireland are offered in Northern Ireland. There are a number of very small uh, exceptions to that. I mean, for example, veterinary science would be, would be one of those. There's also opportunities in, in Great Britain, uh, notably Scotland, uh, in that regard as well. Um, it's important that we, first of all, signpost people so that they're, they're aware of the, the opportunities. And uh, the number of students from uh, Northern Ireland that are going south is remarkably small, uh, given the fact that we do uh, share an island, and has been quite small for the past uh, num number of years. There's a greater flow of students coming, coming northwards. Uh, so th the issue that we, we have is multifaceted, but it is one uh, that is considerably un unbalanced and a lot of the work has to be to address that balance so we have a, a natural flow based upon informed choice in both directions on the island. I call Ms. Sandra Overland. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answer so far. Following the Scottish referendum, has the Minister had any co uh, conversations with his counterpart in, in Scotland with regard to support uh, for those students from Northern Ireland who travel across to Scotland to, for undergraduate study? Well, I have not had the opportunity to have any discussions uh, since the referendum in the, the, uh, the past uh, week, week or so, but the situation um, remains largely unchanged on the, on the back of uh, that uh, outcome, and um, the, the member will be aware uh, of the, the situation where uh, students from here and the fees that they are charged uh, in that regard. Um, I think uh, there was a lot of speculation before the referendum as to what would be the situation uh, in the event that uh, Scotland did opt for, for independence. And uh, in that context, uh, all the legal advice, apart from I think just from the Scottish Government's own advice, was that uh, students from Northern Ireland would be treated as the same as any, anywhere else in the European Union, it would have to be treated the same as, as uh, local Scottish students. Thank you. And I call Mr. Ali Geeston. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number five. According to the College, uh, 1,141 students and trainees participated in work placements in the 2013-14 academic year as part of their programmes of learning. In addition, uh, the College has extremely good working relationships with employers in, the, in its area and engages with over 5,000 employers to obtain relevant work placements as close to students' homes as possible. The process of obtaining, monitoring and evaluating work placements takes significant effort by the College but is a key element of the student experience and an integral part of their study. I can also advise that the College has developed bespoke software called Business Engagement Student Tracking to monitor placements. Research emphasises the importance of work placements. In particular, learners benefit from experience of the work environment to complement their studies. This is also a very effective way for learners to acquire the all-important employability skills required by employers. My department current reviews of further education and youth training are considering how work placements can be included in the most effective way in individual students' programmes of learning. The Youth Employment Scheme is a voluntary scheme designed to help young people develop the skills needed to get a job. It also recognises that employability skills are more readily obtained by active participation in a work setting with an employer or a voluntary organisation. Could I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, I'm sure the Minister is aware of the excellent work that Charter NI do in um, training and helping uh, do education courses with uh, young people, especially from a Protestant working class background. Um, the only problem there is is trying to get work placements for, for those. Um, is there anything more the Minister could do uh, through his department to help Charter NI get work placements? Well, I, I, first of all, I would just stress that in terms of any contracts uh, that Charter and I would be uh, providing uh, on behalf of, of the department and indeed pu with public money are open to, to all uh, sections of, of the community. And it's important that that is made uh, ex extremely clear. And while the member may be conscious of, of particular issues in terms of one section of the community, it's important that we have a, a neutral approach in terms of the provision of, of, of resources. The member is right to, to stress the importance uh, of uh, engaging with employers to source placements. Uh, this is, is an ongoing challenge. It's something that we have uh, experienced with the current Training for Success uh, programme and indeed uh, other schemes that uh, we, we've been uh, wor working with. We can take some um, encouragement from the experience with the Youth Employment Scheme, where a considerable number of employers uh, came forward, and that was, I think, largely driven by very good proactive engagement with uh, employers directly and also the, the various business uh, organisations. It's also important to get the message out that employers do want to have 
surety that they will have a strong pipeline of young people coming through. And the only way that they can ensure they're having both the, the right technical skills but also the employability skills is to offer uh, work placements uh, to young people so they can begin that task uh, of investing in those particular skills. And uh, I am pleased, pleased to say that more and more employers are recognising that. Thank you. And I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number six. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I wish to group questions uh, 6 and 15 and would like to request an, an additional minute for the answer. Uh, members are aware from my statement uh, of the 1st of July that the International Panel completed its review and delivered its report aspiring to excellence on the initial teacher education infrastructure in Northern Ireland. The report has proposed four options for future structures, which are a collaborative partnership, a two centre model with the Belfast Institute of Education and the second centre based in the North West a Northern Ireland Teacher Education Federation and the Northern Ireland Institute of Education. I do not regard these options as mutually exclusive nor as the totality of the range of possibilities before us. Rather, they serve as a very useful guide shaping discussions as we go forward. In my statement, I ask the sector to use the summer months to consider the content of the report and the options. I also committed to engage with the initial teacher education sector in the autumn to discuss the review panel's report. As a, first, as a first step during September, I have met with the four initial teacher education providers, Queen's, Tramillas, Mary's and the University of Ulster, to hear each institution's views and discuss how best to find a way forward. The meetings have been constructive and engagement will continue as we consider how best to align the views put forward by each of the institutions with the options suggested by the panel. I would, however, remind members that both the, the International Panel and the Stage 1 report on the cost of teacher, edu teacher education training and the, the financial sustainability of the university colleges agree that the status quo is not an option in relation both to the quality of initial teacher education provided and for financial reasons. My main aim in this process continues to be how we can best structure a system that can deliver world-class standards of teacher education, is financially sustainable, promotes greater sharing and integration, and is in the best interests of our young people. Mr Buchanan for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his response. And the Minister obviously agrees that the status quo is no longer an option. Can he then uh, advise the House how he does then propose to take the issue forward, given that St Mary's, unlike the other four colleges, has refused any of the four options currently on the table? Well, um, I am still considering what is the best way forward, and there is no fixed uh, approach that we, that we are taking. At present, we are working through uh, bilateral discussions uh, with the, the, the institutions. Um, I can say that I, I have had um, some very constructive discussions uh, with St Mary's uh, within, within, the past, within the past week, and uh, we have made a commitment to have uh, further discussions. Uh, and while the member is, is correct to report that um, they do not favour any of the four options uh, on the table, um, they are nonetheless willing uh, to, to consider uh, what is the best way forward uh, for their, their institution and indeed uh, the system. Um, it, is, it is fair to say that St Mary's themselves recognise that the status quo uh, is not an option. Uh, obviously, the member himself and indeed others in the House, and perhaps even including myself, uh, would have more ambitious views in terms of how we can take forward uh, reform. Uh, but I, will, I would at this stage say that all of the institutions are willing to engage in further discussions with me and the department. I was going to ask the Minister, would he give time to the international expert panel to examine a proposal on the international expert panel to examine a proposal on shared education that was put forward by Peter Finn from St Mary's University College before he, the Minister, brings forward his own proposals on this review? Well, what I would say to the member is, is no further piece of work is excluded from uh, current uh, discussions. Now, the panel have formally uh, discharged uh, their, their commitment uh, to the department, uh, and indeed they have given evidence uh, to the Employment and Learning uh, Committee uh, in, 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 re in recent days. What the, the member has set out uh, can take place at any stage, and indeed could have taken place at any stage uh, in the past. And uh, it's no doubt that there will be issues there that we, will, will, we, that we will wish to reflect upon in terms of any potential for progress. Mr. Alec Atwood. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, whilst you aren't ruling anything in uh, or ruling anything out, what is your view on the uh, previous proposal from Queen's University? 
which was essentially a land grab of the lands at Stranmilis site that was more to do with development and less to do with education. And what is your view on the comments made by the uh, Board of Governors, the Dell Committee, in this place a couple of weeks ago, uh, where they made proposals or said they had proposals in fact, St Mary's, yet staff at uh, Stranmilis College, many staff, say they knew nothing about those proposals? Well, there's quite a, a lot of issues in, in there, which I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to work through as best I can. In terms of what is my view on, on the way forward? Um, I'm not sure it would be terribly uh, productive for me to, to stake uh, a claim and say this is the, 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 the way forward and the only way forward. Um, I, it's important that we have a, a proper discussion amongst all of the providers. Uh, I have made clear that the direction of travel uh, that I want to see in, in this regard, uh, but it's important to recognise that there may well be a variety of different institutional formats uh, that can fall within, within those parameters. The only thing I would say is the status quo as it currently stands uh, is not uh, sustainable. Um, we do need to be encouraging more shared integration in terms of teacher uh, education. We have to ensure that it is of world-class standard and in particular it has greater uh, interaction uh, with, uh, with, with research excellence and we also have to ensure that we have a financially sustainable system. So those are the key principles as we move forward. Uh, and while Mr Atwood may wish to ascribe certain um, ambitions to or certain uh, perspectives behind the Queen's University uh, um, approach. Let me be very clear that the three principles I have outlined uh, are the basis of my approach uh, towards the, this issue and is about ensuring that we have a world-class system of teacher education in Northern Ireland, nothing more and nothing less than that. And with respect to Strom Millis, um, Obviously, we will wish to take on board the views of staff, but constitutionally, the department deals uh, with the Board of Governors. Uh, the Board of Governors is appointed by me, uh, and uh, indeed the Chair is appointed by me, and it's directly with them that we will officially receive the views of the College. Mr Michael McGimsey. Thank you, Mr uh, Speaker. Can I say, listening to the Minister's answer to Mr Atwood, it appears to be that we're hearing very clearly his view, and the concern is, of course, that the Minister's view is the review that the review will come up with in the end. Is he satisfied, uh, or will he be satisfied with a, a review finding that is at variance with his own particular viewpoint and that of his party? And will he also ensure uh, that there's proper consultation uh, within the various colleges uh, so that we will not have anyone feeling that they're being disenfranchised in what appears to be a, a, a very long and convoluted process? Two things uh, to, to the member. First of all, in terms of, of fixed viewpoints, his own party, uh, through uh, my predecessor, Mr. Kennedy, uh, before the last assembly election, issued a consultation document that quite clearly uh, endorsed a merger between Queen's University and Stranmillis as the way forward. So that was a, a fixed view, and that's down on paper as part of, part of the formal record. I have, um, in response to Mr Atwood, set out um, the three broad principles that guide the approach uh, that I am taking forward uh, in, in this regard. And I have said that there can be a range of different institutional formats uh, that uh, could fall uh, within the parameters of those three guiding principles. And I do not see the potential for any um, outcome um, emerging that finds favour acro across the board, and my own personal opinion uh, being difficult to, to establish. Uh, I think it is important that everyone works works constructively uh, so that we can, we can achieve that. And if, if everyone shares the ambition around those principles and the desire to see a world-class system, then we will find an answer. Mr Barry McElduff. Number seven, Cash Diver Shacht. Employment remains a major challenge in Northern Ireland in common with other parts of these islands and elsewhere in Europe. Almost a third of those unemployed fall within the 18 to 24 age group. This challenge has been proactively addressed by my department and the wider executive. Responses include the Youth Employment Scheme and the Pathways to, to Success Strategy. Wider reforms, including the review of careers, the new strategy on apprenticeships and the forthcoming uh, new uh, youth training system, will all help to reduce the incidence of youth unemployment in the future. The, the situation around youth unemployment no doubt causes young people to reflect upon their future opportunities. These, these statistics collected do not fully capture uh, the internal and external movements of young people. Uh, figures produced by the Northern Ireland uh, Statistics and Research Agency do give an indication around long-term migration flows. In 2012-2013, uh, some 7,700 18- to 24-year-olds left Northern Ireland and 5,900 came in, a net outward migration of 1,800, or 1% 1 of that age group. 
In 2000-2001, when youth unemployment was much lower, at 5,700, 18 to 24-year-olds left Northern Ireland and 4,000 came in, a net outward migration of 70, 1,700 individuals or again around 1 per cent of that age group. An order uh, that is uh, the end of time for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions and I call Ms Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister um, what steps his department has taken to encourage non-academic based further education for school leavers? Well, the, the member is, pro is probably aware that we are uh, in the process of doing a major a review uh, of youth training. That is very much geared around those young people um, who would be leaving school uh, at the age uh, of 16 or 17, um, who have the potential uh, to engage in the world of work. Uh, we have an expert panel uh, in place uh, from a range of different uh, stakeholders that is advising us around uh, the development of the strategy. As envisaged within that, th there will be uh, two different strands. One will be uh, an employed strand through what you could term a, a traineeship. Uh, the other will be a non-employed strand, but it's nevertheless still linked to work placements, which builds upon the, the comments I made to Mr Easton uh, earlier on. Uh, we hope to have a draft consultation paper ready uh, within the next few weeks and go out to public consultation uh, towards the end of the autumn, with a view to having agreement on a new strategy uh, in the spring of 2015. Call Mrs. Cameron for a supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his, his answer and for the information he's, he's given the House today. Um, the Minister may not be aware, but can, can he possibly answer this question or look into it um, and find out why funding has been removed from the Michael Hughes Academy BTEC Diploma in Sport Development, Coaching and Fitness at Newton Abbey Regional College? Um, and this is, this is ended four weeks after the commencement of the course. I'm happy to ensure that the member will be provided uh, with an answer uh, in, in that regard. Obviously, the colleges themselves uh, are responsible for what, what courses are provided and how they manage uh, their budgets. Um, it would only be speculation on my part, but one of the reasons may well be based around the, the figures of enrolments that, that have come through, um, uh, given the, the particular time of year. But um, that's only speculation on my part, and we will share the member gets a full answer. Thank you. And I call Mr Declan Michael Lear. Uh, Could the Minister give us an assessment of uh, how his department is working with other organisations in the, in the OMA and the wider West Rhone area to ensure, their, to ensure that there's adequate, adequate skills training in place to enable people to take up uh, prospective career up or employment opportunities? Well, there's a number of different inter interventions that we have. Um, I mean, first of all, we have the excellent resource uh, of the, the South West College. And as the member uh, will, will know, our, our further education system in, Orland, in Northern Ireland is recognised as being the best uh, in these islands. And within that, South West College is, is being uh, recognised as being one of the very best colleges in, in these islands. So that is a, a very good resource uh, to draw upon. Uh, we also have uh, the, the local uh, jobs and benefits offices and also careers service provision, all of which are, are vehicles to engage uh, with, with, the lo with the local community. Uh, the member will also be aware that uh, in the past week we have uh, officially launched the, the next tranche of the European uh, Social Fund. And one of the issues that we are keen to ensure is that there's a, a more even geographical drawdown uh, of funds and that we have better engagement uh, with, with local communities, particularly through the, the new council structure, uh, to, to work with us uh, around um, the various proposals that, that will come forward. And hopefully uh, the member will see the, the fruits of that over the, the coming months. I call Mr McAleer for supplementary. Uh, is the Minister concerned that there is an increasing number of very highly skilled and trained people who have been forced to take up jobs which are which considered as low skilled, thereby um, minimising or not making full use of the repertoire of, repertoire of skills and training? Well, absolutely. I mean, my, my, uh over overriding objective as Minister for Employment and Learning is to ensure that we have uh, proper efficiency of supply and demand uh, within the, the, the labour market um, and also that we are, are addressing our skilled needs. And though overall, uh, it, is, it is quite clear that we will have a much higher demand for higher level skills uh, over the coming years and in particular around STEM subjects. 
Now, even with, within higher level skills, there can sometimes be a skills mismatch. And that's why it's important that we do have proper careers advice uh, and also that we uh, encourage people uh, to take up opportunities in some of the high growth uh, sectors uh, within, within the economy. The member is quite right. Whenever that goes wrong, we have a situation of, of underemployment, either in terms of the number of hours people are working or in terms of the areas in which they are uh, being employed, where, where they are uh, overqualified. And that can have knock on consequences elsewhere elsewhere in terms of displacing other people's opportunities. So through things like uh, what we're doing around uh, careers, what we're doing around apprenticeships, and what we're doing in terms of investing in further education and higher education, we're trying to drive that type of situation out of our economy, and we all stand to benefit if we get it right. Thank you. And I call Mr Tom Buchanan. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Minister, given the earlier debate that we had on student hardship funds, can you advise what impact the lack of agreement by Sinn Féin and the SDLP on welfare reform could have on the future of the funding for uh, this important issue? I'm glad the member stressed the word could have. Um, at this stage, the, the current budget uncertainty has not impacted upon that particular intervention around um, FE awards and, and, har and hardship funds. There has been a little bit of confusion in terms of the fact that uh, we have identified underspends in terms of student finance as being one of the areas through which we are seeking to manage the, the current in-year pressures. That is a reflection of the fact that uh, we have to set a budget allocation based upon an estimate of demand and that we are projecting that demand will come in uh, below the budget, uh, allowing us to have what is in effect a, a reduced requirement that can be moved elsewhere uh, within the system. However, um, members will be aware that we are looking at four and a half plus 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 uh, on an in-year situation. Next year, the current speculation is that there will be cuts uh, in excess of 10 per cent and well in excess of 10, of 10 per cent, and that will continue into, into future years. That will have a massive impact uh, right across the board in terms of what my department uh, is doing. More immediately, I, will, I would make the point that um, while I am nonetheless seeking to act strategically and to protect the most vulnerable in society from uh, the, the cuts, uh, we do have a certain inequity in terms of the, the, the approach that has been taken to date, whereby we have had protection given to the Department of, of Education. This means that 16 to 19 year olds um, who are in school situation will benefit from protection, whereas the 40 per cent of, of the 16 to 19 year olds who are in further education and training um, do not avail of protection. The fact that we have sought to protect them uh, is, is due to our own actions, not the, the strategic decisions taken by the executive. That is a, an inequity, and it becomes doubly so whenever you consider the different socio-economic background of the two cohorts uh, that we are talking about. Thank the Minister for his response. And again, uh, obviously, the protection of these frontline services will have a knock-on effect on all our programmes. Can the Minister advise what other programmes, what other programmes within his department will suffer as a result of the protection of these services and the continual reduction of funding in his department? We, we have explained to the committee how we have approached uh, the situation in year, and uh, our, our books are balanced in, insofar as we, the four and a half percent that has been announced uh, so far. What we do beyond that has still to be determined, and we, we have some options in, in that regard. Um, and while I have sought to act strategically and to protect those who are most vulnerable, whenever we're in the situation where we're facing cuts uh, in excess of uh, 10, 15 per cent, uh, all bets are off, and it becomes next to impossible to give any guarantees uh, of protecting any particular area of activity in, in the department. And if we were to, to try to do that, we would massively skew commit commitments elsewhere. The only thing I, I could say to the member is that going down this route really isn't sustainable. I mean, we, I mean, we can't simply just keep cutting and cutting and cutting budgets in order to put off taking a, a difficult decision. It's not the way any mature government will go about its business. Thank you. And I call Dr Alistair Macdonald. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And I know the Minister has touched on apprenticeships, but for me, one of our biggest, the biggest aspects of the economic crisis is that hundreds, indeed thousands, of our bright young people are forced to emigrate because of a lack of employment opportunity. Could the Minister give us some estimation of how long it will take before we can have an effective apprenticeship programme in place that works for young people and creates decent employment opportunities? Well, 
the, the, the timescale for the full implementation of the new strategy is September of 2016, so to give the, the member a very direct answer, uh, that's the, the timescale, but between now and then a lot of work will take place in terms of the implementation of the strategy, and already we've had a number of pilots in, in terms of higher level um, apprenticeships, and we're also working to create the first of our sector partnerships, which gives employers a direct voice uh, in all of this. I would also stress to the member that a lot of work is being done to create jobs in Northern Ireland, both by local companies and also through attracting inward investment. And the member will be aware that Invest in I uh, have had a, a very successful year, indeed their most successful year ever. Uh, that's strongly supported by my own department's Shared Skills programme, uh, whereby we can give uh, guarantees to invest in companies that they will have the skills base locally here uh, to take up the, the jobs that they, they will be uh, creating. So we are being successful in creating jobs locally. And while outward migration is still sadly a factor of Northern Ireland, I do expect that that will decrease uh, over the, the, the coming years. And also that a number of people who have previously left Northern Ireland may seek to return, given the, the job opportunities that are now being created. Dr. Macdonald, for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And could I thank the Minister for his very full answer there and very direct answer. But the Minister will be aware that due to various liabilities that have arisen in recent times in terms of insurance demands, in terms of public liability and the insurance of the apprentice and so on, it's increasingly difficult for a business or a trade to take on an apprentice. Can we build some mechanism into the, the system going forward that such insurance liabilities for the company and indeed to cover the individual apprentice from any particular damage that might take place either to him or be done by him or her, that in fact that, that, that's taken care of because that seems to me to be the biggest obstacle for many tradesmen taking on apprentices. I suspect the issue that uh, Dr. McDonnell is raising is more of an issue around work placements where the person in question is not the employee of the company uh, as such. Uh, in terms of an apprenticeship, uh, the apprentice is an employee uh, of, the, of the sponsoring company and would be covered by the existing insurance policies uh, that that company uh, would have. But in, in the wider sense, it's also worth highlighting that we are developing a central service, which again is a new departure for Northern Ireland, uh, which will be run by my department, uh, which is there to, to work with employers directly around advertising vacancies, to a portal to encourage young people to, to apply for apprenticeships, and also to deal with a lot of the bureaucracy. One of the particular issues that we are trying to address is the barriers that um, SMEs experience around apprenticeships. Now, right around the world, um, we see a pattern where apprenticeships are more readily provided through larger companies and less so through SMEs. Even if you look to somewhere like Switzerland or Germany, that's also uh, the case. Uh, and it's important that government does seek to put in place, as far as we possibly can, incentives and also assistance to try to break that, 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 uh, that, that barrier that uh, discourages uh, the SMEs from engaging. And uh, some of those issues that the member touches upon beyond insurance uh, will be the type, the type of, of uh, issues that we will watch to explore through that mechanism. Thank you. And I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Can the, minister, can the Minister confirm with me that people with a hearing loss have to pay for sign language classes at further education colleges? Um, what I would say to the member is that very much depends on the particular circumstances uh, that um, uh, pre pre prevail. And uh, we've had a very use useful debate this morning around um, uh, student, student finance. Uh, and also we have stressed that at a large number, <coughs> a large number of situations we have access uh, to support uh, in terms of disability student allowances and also access to, to the additional support uh, 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 funds which allow um, a lot of mechanisms to be introduced to help uh, students with a whole range of different, different disabilities. But it very much depends upon the individual circumstances and, uh, and the cases that, uh, that do, do arise. And I call Mr. McMullen for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister so far? But will the, will the Minister not agree under equality legislation that uh, those, those classes should be free to deaf people in order for them to facilitate as fully as possible in all aspects of their lives? Well, I would just go back to what I have said. Uh, and, um, 
I mean, if there's any inequalities in the system, uh, I'm certainly committed to, to, to driving those out. Um, but there is a range of support that does exist already, and indeed our colleges are bound uh, to, to abide by equality leg legislation in all, in all its forms. So if something is not quite right, uh, and we're happy to, to, to look at that on behalf of, of the member, then it will, 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 it will be remedied. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And order time is up, and that concludes question time. I invite the House.